ahead, Council Chair. You're ready. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we met earlier today at 2 p.m. wearing our hats as the Redevelopment Agency Board. And now we're changing hats to our City Council um, roles for our work session and to discuss some further briefing items. At 7 o'clock tonight, we'll be holding a limited formal meeting, which means it's not a standard formal meeting agenda. And the Council will consider only one business item, a resolution that would extend the Mayor's March 18th proclamation declaring a local emergency relating to a magnitude 5.7 earthquake. The limited formal meeting will not provide an opportunity for public comment. The next opportunity for public comment will be at the Council's Tuesday, April 24th formal meeting at 7 p.m. Also, the Council always welcomes your comments by mailing us at P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84114 5476, or emailing us at council.comments at slcgov or by calling our 24 hour phone comment line, 801 535 7654. All agenda related comments received through any source are shared with the Council and added to the Council's public record within 24 hours following the meeting. For instructions to guide you on how to participate electronically in any of our WebEx meetings, you can visit slccouncil.com or call 801-535-7600. We'll now begin our work session meeting um, with um, item number one, which is an informational update related to the mayor's proclamations declaring local emergencies for COVID-19 and the recent earthquake. Um, updating us, we'll have um, Salt Lake City Mayor Aaron Mendenhall and Rachel Otto, Chief of Staff, um, and Lisa Schaefer, Deputy Chief of Staff, and then also Katie Lewis, City Attorney. Yes, Mr. Chair. Hey, everybody. Kind of getting Thank used you. to this as our Tuesday format now. Um, and I just want to give my compliments to the council staff for how wonderfully you run these meetings, particularly the co public comment section during the formal with such grace and uh, care. And it really comes through. I know that the public um, feels that and I appreciate the way that you're continuing to create an opportunity for us to hear from our residents and the businesses in the city. So today is my 100th day in office. Woo! <laughs> you made it. I, I think I made it. You know, I just want to make it another day. Um, and it's uh, it's uh, different than we were yesterday. So today we announced that we are um, accepting donations of homemade masks for our employees. And hopefully that we'll get enough that we'll have enough for members, vulnerable members of the community. This citywide mask donation is, um, there's information on our website and we're linking people to the CDC website that gives guidance on how to make a mask. There's no sew options. They can be made from uh, all sorts of fabric, even t-shirts and um, hopefully I think, I know I, I feel safe in guessing that you as council members are hearing from constituents like I am that are home, but really want to help and they want to know how they can help. So I hope that this will be something that people can do um, and they can donate those masks at any of the Salt Lake City Fire Departments. We've situated um, clean bins from our refuse department that are hopefully now all identified and marked. People can drop them off in there without having to um, come into contact with any of the firefighters. We'll collect them nightly and we will wash them and then distribute them to our employees. We're hoping to have two masks per frontline employee, one that they can wear, another that they could be laundering. Um, and then, as I said, hopefully enough that as our frontline employees, even police and fire come into contact with vulnerable members of the community that they can give them a mask as well. So that started today and I've, imp I've approved employees, Salt Lake City employees, um, being paid their normal rates for the jobs that they um, or, or what they would normally be paid for their job to sew masks. So people who have those skills that are city employees, we are connecting them with materials that are already owned by the city. 
and we're setting them up to be able to make masks as well. Um, we are helping the county and the state with some staffing requests as well. There's um, some county quarantine and isolation centers that need staff and need drivers. Also, the airport needs people to hand out the information cards that uh, help to identify and trace people coming into the state. So we've put the call out to our 3,000 plus employees with Salt Lake City that anyone who can um, step up to come on and help our county, state, and airport do these extended jobs. Um, we're, we, we're looking to give that support. We've also, ex um, we're working to expand the emergency food program with Salt Lake City School District. As you know, they are providing meals for any person age zero to 18 and food boxes for families in Salt Lake City. Um, one thing that we've that I've learned and that we're hearing from communities, um, particularly diverse communities, that uh, some food banks require people to uh, present identification in order to receive food for entire families. So you have to show that you have this many kids and um, provide some sort of identification to val basically validate your ability to get that much food. And this, of course, deters some people who don't um, perhaps have that identification or feel comfortable sharing that. And the school district is not requiring that, which I'm grateful for. Um, they are distributing food without having to sh prove your family or show your identification. They have, um, at this point, sufficient food resources, but they had insufficient staff to package that food up. And so we have uh, asked, we're, we're planning right now to set up a Salt Lake City food packing site and to bring our own staff. Again, we'd pay our staff. Um, these are teams of six that work at a distance from one another, receive the load of food that is um, through the Utah Food Bank and the school district and have the instructions on how to pack that up. So we're working to amplify the work that the school district is doing to helping feed our communities with our own employees um, time. And those projected needs right now are around Bryant Middle School, Benyon, and Washington Elementary School areas. We're hoping to be able to implement this on Monday, April 20th. So those are the uh, updates today. I know Rachel has information on um, Proclamation 7, and I can, which I signed on Friday. Um, Rachel, do you want me to go into that, or do you want to usually kick the proclamations to Rachel? Um, look, Mayor, before you go there, can you, do you have like a, um, something that we can share and council members can share like on their social media um, about the mask program? Yeah. Or like some bullet points just so that we can help get the word out about that? Yeah, I'll ask Lindsay and Molly to get that over to you right away. Okay. Is it linked on the website, Mayor? Um, Honestly, I, I want to say yes, but I haven't checked myself today. I don't know if any of my staff that's on the meeting can answer that for us. Uh, that's okay. We, if we can't, if we don't know right now, we can find out um, when you send us those other materials. So. Okay. Do you want me to tick through the proclamation, Mr. Chair? Yes, please. Okay, the Proclamation 7 was issued on April 10th. It goes through a few things. Any res residential or commercial landlord will be eligible for a one-year deferment of all Salt Lake City-based business licensing fees if a base fee is applicable to the property owner and upon their providing the city's um, division of business licensing with certain documentation, which basically is documentation that shows um, with a signature of their tenants and from the landlord that they uh, did not displace people due to the impacts of COVID-19 um, during this time period. Uh, second is to the extent that Salt Lake City employees are asked to assist with residential eviction activities, such as um, we're prohibiting such assistance un unless the assistance is necessary to protect public health and safety. So, uh, city law enforcement doesn't carry out eviction enforcement. The county sheriff's office typically does that, but occasionally they're called to assist, and this proclamation is prohibiting that assistance unless it's 
health and safety related. Third is um, all improvement area assessments to private property business or private property owners within the central business district improvement area are deferred for the next 90 days from April 10th. And if you anybody has questions, just jump in on me. Uh, next is any medical professional or first responder or other resident of Salt Lake City whose employment includes potential exposure to COVID-19 may park an RV on a city street adjacent to their primary residence for uh, just so they can sleep near home and at the same time avoid family members uh, so as not to expose them potentially to COVID-19. So even though we'd already excused parking limits in the city with previous proclamations, this uh, applies to RVs. Any restaurant or, or bar within Salt Lake City with a fully executed right-of-way encroachment agreement between the restaurant or property owner in Salt Lake City. Uh, what this is talking about is outdoor dining, seating, or other restaurant or bar-related encroachment. So you can imagine a bar, your favorite bar restaurant perhaps, that has outdoor seating that's on the public right-of-way on the sidewalk space. They rent that space from the city. Um, they're, they're, all of those entities are receiving a 90-day deferral of their 2020 encro encroachment fees. Next is any tenant leasing city-owned or RDA uh, real property with a valid written lease prior to the date of this April 10th proclamation will receive a rent deferral for the months of May and June. Now there's just two more. The developed picnic sites in City Creek Canyon and developed campgrounds in Affleck Park will remain closed to public recreation until the termination of this proclamation. And finally, the overflow shelter at St. Vincent de Paul Center will remain open until the end of June for individuals experiencing homelessness. Are there any questions? Council members, um... Do you have any questions? Okay. Thank um, you. I don't see any. Thank you, Mayor. Um, all right, we will go uh, now to um, our uh, resolution for local emergency declaration extension for the magnitude 5.7 earthquake. Um, okay. Yeah, back to you, back to Mayor and also uh, Rachel Otto, Chief of Staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Lisa Schaefer is on deck to talk okay. earthquake with you. We did want to raise one other kind of COVID related issue with you. We can do that after the earthquake conversation, but it deals with the Arts Council and some um, some grant funding that we want to just talk with you a little bit about. So maybe after Lisa um, takes a minute to talk earthquake, we can return to COVID and I'll ask Ben Collender to give you a little overview of what we're thinking with that funding. Okay, great. Thank Thanks, you. Lisa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rachel. So um, following the earthquake on March 18th, the mayor issued an emergency declaration for the earthquake specific. And I just wanted to say thank you to council staff for flagging this for us for an extension. Um, so the, it is unclear right now whether or not any FEMA uh, reimbursement is going to be available. Um, residents have, the public has until the 22nd to get their preliminary damage reports into the county. Uh, from there, those go to the state for their mitigation team um, who submits an entire package to FEMA for review. Um, and so it, it takes into consideration, this review takes into consideration the estimated dollar amount of damage and then the amount of property insurance that covers that damage. And so uh, we would like to request that this proclamation remain open until we have final uh, determination from FEMA as to whether or not um, any, any reimbursement will be available. Okay, great. And Mr. Chair, the one thing for the council to decide right now, the uh, end date is blank. Um, we didn't really have a specific end date in mind. The county uh, picked the date of July 
six, I believe, to extend their emergency to, but um, wanted to leave it to council discretion. So both the resolution and the motion sheet have a blank where the um, expiration date is. So it's up to you guys. Yeah, and if I if I might interject a little bit here as far as context, for those of you who were around uh, during the microburst that produced some flash flooding a couple of years ago, that FEMA determination was not actually made for a couple of months uh, after the event. And so it's really hard for us to recommend an actual date to extend the emergency. Uh, but I would say that when you're dealing with um, this many layers of government, um, it's not going to happen that quickly. So uh, we would like to leave it up to you, obviously, and you always have the right to extend uh, or to terminate that order. Um, but we don't expect that that information is going to be very forthcoming after the April 22nd deadline. I would I would expect a couple of months after that. Okay. Um, do council members have any questions about that? So, um, so we have to keep the the emergency open in order to get this funding. It's not exactly clear that we have to leave the emergency open, but I think out uh, to stay consistent with the county's lead on this, who is our next line up, um, they have extended it. And so to stay consistent, I think that that's the wise thing to do. Katie might have some, uh, you know, something to offer there from a legal perspective, but I, but I think that this is, is more of a, you know, follow, following suit, basically. Do you know how long they extended theirs? Uh, they extended theirs till July 6th, but when we um, requested uh, information as to why that date was significant, it just wasn't significant. It was sort of the, net, the Tuesday after the last meeting or so, I don't know. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily significant. They just stretched it out and uh, um, similar to what they did with the COVID expansion, they just they chose to do a longer extension as opposed to a 30 day or whatever it was that we decided to do. Okay. Katie Lewis, city attorney, did you have anything you wanted to add? The only thing that I will add is in my research on how this FEMA money flows down, there's a period of time for the federal government to accept our local emergencies and start to flow that money. And given the, the pandemic and the fact that this is sort of a second emergency and that I'm assuming the federal government is paying attention to a lot of different things, that may be the reason why the, the county left their earthquake emergency open and why it may make sense for us to do that until we know that the emergency has been accepted. Okay. And are there any um, like legal implications to extending the emergency that would interfere with anything? Uh, not none that I can think of, Council Chair. And this emergency uh, is was you know sort of a date in time and isn't the same as the what you're seeing with the COVID emergency where. Uh, there are a lot of emergency powers being exercised and contemplated. So really the only purpose of extending right now is to access those federal funds. Okay. Okay. All right. And um, council member Mono. Yeah. I, I just had a question also probably for Katie. Um, is are we extending the emergency situation or are we extending the actual proclamation? Like, will we have to go back and extend all seven of the, or all six, I guess, of the COVID related proclamations? Or is it that we have two sort of concurrent emergency situations and then the mayor can make as many proclamations as she deems necessary within that time period? I, I guess I'm a little confused about how that works. That's a great question. Thanks for that. So. Your second example is uh, is what's happening here. There is a process for the mayor to declare an emergency, and that's sort of the what. Um, and we had two at the same, you know, pretty much concurrently: coronavirus, COVID nineteen, and the earthquake. So the mayor has declared a local emergency for both of those. Once that emergency is declared, it's in place for thirty days, or the emergency itself 
can be extended, which is what you are contemplating today for the earthquake and what you contemplated last week for COVID-19. That's, that's the question that you're being asked today is, does the emergency extend? Then both state law and city code allow for the mayor to exercise emergency powers while that local emergency is in effect. Uh, the mayor has not exercised any emergency powers for the earthquake, but as you are aware, she has exercised a series of emergency powers for the COVID-19, which is why I, I previously said, um, you know, when you're thinking about extending the earthquake emergency, um, there, aren't, there aren't emergency powers that are being exercised uh, right now for that. And really the purpose is to ensure that the, the city has access to those federal funds. Thank you. Hey, um, I don't see any other question or um, hands or questions on this. So, um, but I do want to go back to the um, COVID emergency um, because uh, the item that um, that uh, Rachel Otto brought up about um, the Arts Council, and then I believe we also had some information from. Um, from Ben about the emergency loan program that council members had questions on. So, sorry, I moved on from that item too quickly. So we wanna go back to that. Rachel, do you wanna to talk to us about the Arts Council proposal? Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I actually will let Ben do that too, just because he'll get all the funding amounts correct okay. more easily than I will. Um, but thanks for giving us some time to at least raise this issue with you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel and, and uh, Council Chair Wharton. Just a, a quick update and something we wanted to run by the Council at the early stage. Uh, the Department received a request uh, from the Arts Council Foundation, which is the nonprofit arm of uh, the Arts Council. And uh, just for a little bit of background, for us to consider any contract modifications, uh, what we ask is for the Foundation Board uh, to consider and approve that request to the department, just so we know that we are consistent with what, uh, if we take action as a department with a contract modification, that um, we are consistent with what the board is requesting as well, not just um, city staff. So just a, a sort of mechanism that we have in place uh, to make sure that we're getting as much feedback as possible. So last Thursday, the board met uh, and considered a request uh, to the department, um, which was for repurposing about $50,000 in funds uh, to uh, support local artists. So you, we've seen several programs out here that can support arts organizations and businesses, but this is specifically targeted towards artists, individual artists. So um, the intent is to ask for a straw poll next week on the subject, but wanted to give an early stage heads up that we uh, did receive this request from the Arts Council Foundation Board, and we wanted to bring it up to council members at the early stage. And we also have Felicia on the line um, to maybe talk about the program side a little bit more and what uh, the partnership with the state uh, is that's being contemplated. Felicia, are you on? Yeah, I'm here. Can you all hear me? Yes. Hi, it's nice to see all of you. Um, so, so a couple of things happened to that um, kind of led us to um, the idea of developing this program. Um, one is some funds that we will not be executing on because of canceled events. And the other is some grant funding that we have that is existing. So under the purview of our non-departmental contract with the city, um, we do programming and grants. So um, we really identified this need. A number of other cities have funds for individual artists. Um, there are currently no relief funds for individual artists. They're just right now for organizations. Um, and a lot of independent contractors are having a hard time with unemployment. So the program is a targeted um, emergency fund with $500 um, awards or grants to uh, individual artists and we would like to have that fund be at about fifty thousand um, dollars the intention is that we develop a co-application with the state for the reason that 
they have funding, um, some funding for the same purpose and that we want to, we work closely with them, receive funds from them already. And we want to ensure that resources can be distributed as widely as possible so that people, if we had our own program and they had a program, we're not duplicating funding. So we would develop a co-application, they would gather all the data and then the review criteria we develop in tandem together. And we of course just pay out the relief funds to only Salt Lake City residents as we normally do. Um, so the rubric and grant processes are, are already kind of well in place for our organization. Um, and, and we're really hopeful that we would be able to execute this in partnership with the state. And I'm happy to take any, any questions about um, process or, or that sort of thing. Okay. Um, how does this, um, what, where, what was this money going to be used for? Okay, great question. So there's two um, sort of areas. Um, one is uh, an outreach um, category that we have for programming, which was for the Busker Festival, which was set to happen in June. So we would still like to execute a virtual option of that, as well as some other outreach activities related to living traditions in this fiscal year. But those um, activities that we're currently planning would be much less expensive. And so 50,000 was originally for a contract for the Busker Festival. We would like to use 43,500 of that for this emergency fund. And then we have approximately $6,800 already allocated to grant funding, um, which would just be a different um, grant uh, pool that all of this money already exists in our in our non-departmental contract in our budget. Okay. Um, and how is this different? Um, is this or is this different from other emergency loans that we've given out? Um, in terms of, you know, what we're asking from the artists, what do they have to, what information do they have to produce for us? Sure. Um, and, what, and with our, with our last one that we, um, the emergency loan program that went to the businesses, this was to also keep, it was to keep the businesses afloat and to keep the employees um, to, to cover payroll. So what would we be asking them to produce for this? Um, so the so the main difference is that this is not a loan, and it's also um, significantly less dollar amount. So they're only they're capped at five hundred dollars. Um, this um, came from research on a lot of national models. So there there's a number of criteria um, that we've developed, but um, they must be Utah artists that are practicing. Um, they, most of our artists in the state are not full-time artists. It's a challenge for them. Um, and, and we view them as small businesses, but because they're singular um, employees of their own businesses, many of them are not eligible at all for the grant, or sorry, for the loans program that we had. Um, so, so a number of funding sources are prohibitive to them. So they must be um, 21 years old, a practicing artist, experiencing financial hardship related to COVID. There's a number of um, obviously taxable, they can receive, um, you know, they're US citizen, they live in Salt Lake City boundaries and um, they haven't received anything from these funds. Um, we also are prioritizing a number of diversity and geographic equity considerations that are in the rubric. They have to provide, um, provide online samples of their artistic practice, whether it's a portfolio or social media sites or any kind of um, two to three samples of collateral. Um, uh, are there other specific questions you have? We ask a number of demographic questions in the application that we post. Amy? Good, yeah, Councilmember Fowler. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Felicia. Yeah. Why do they need to be U.S. citizens? Um, part of the reason is that we have, um, the idea was to develop this program in conjunction with the state. 
Um, and their criteria is a little bit probably more rigid than ours. So that's something that we can look at because the funds would be coming directly from um, the Arts Council Foundation. But it's only really a co-application process with the state. We have different parameters that we are happy to consider um, in the applications that, that we um, put out to the public. Yeah, I personally would like to have that question removed from the application, but that's just me. I, I would agree. I don't know why they can't be um, here on a, um, well, I mean, I don't know that immigration status really matters at all, but. I can I verify it with the state. It was just in a preliminary draft of the application and their, their intention is, um, uh, you know, they, there's a sense of urgency around launching that. And so I, I, we can kind of tag in at any time or we could forge forward on our own. So um, I, I can talk to them about that qualifier because it, it certainly could be negotiable. We're just yeah. trying to get uniformity in the process. But I, yeah, totally uh, I, can, I think we can all think of a number of artists in our community at the top of our head who are, who are not um, from the United States, but are, really got them contributing to the art scene in Salt Lake. And I don't know if they're um, yeah. legal permanent residents or if they have dual citizenship or, or if they've become naturalized, but I would, I would hate to eliminate them. Um, I first saw council member Dugan's hand up. So go ahead, Dan. So the Busker Festival supported artists and we're basically gonna support artists but just in an individual fashion for 86, 87 artists. Is that um, yes, and the, the something we've talked about is uh, all of the people that would normally present at Busker Festival would certainly be eligible for this pool of funding. And again, we still intend to do um, a, a much um, more truncated version. We have, we have a proposal from our contractor that we're working with for a version of Busker Festival. Um, and so, yes, they're they're all eligible, and it would just be supporting individual artists um, in a in a different way. Um, Chris, I just wanted to come back to or Amy, your question. I'm I'm looking more closely at our application, and in in parentheses, it is citizen green card holder or permanent resident who can provide a social security number or W nine. But again, we can look at other modifications to that. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I don't know that the immigration status at all should be a consideration. But if it has to be, then I think we could we could also look at expanding that to people that are here on a valid visa that might not have a work permit. So like student visa um, or spousal visas, things like that. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, we, there's a really great willingness on the part of the state to be collaborative and flexible on this. And we do, um, of course, you know, have an interest of just um, sharing data and, and um, streamlining the process to reach as many people as possible. So there's certainly potential to um, do a separate pool that just comes from the Arts Council for targeted groups. A lot of Arts Councils do that, whether they're refugee communities or um, artists of color, we, we could just launch that on our own. And I would be um, delighted to dedicate some of the funds to targeted groups if we wanted to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there was a question from Councilmember Valdemoros. Yes, so I was gonna follow up. I think I think we can get creative. One second, please. Um, sir. Sorry, guys. <laughs> We're sharing a living room today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so no, no, for sure. You know, we can get creative. I think people that have work permits, um, you know, could should be allowed. Um, I. When, when, in my case, when I was a student, uh, I was able to participate in competitions, which would grant money or a gift, and you know, and that was legal and it was fine. So I think we can get creative, um, you know, in, in terms of that, if if the state allows us. 
Yeah, I really appreciate you um, bringing that up because I think it's always good to to nudge that direction too <laughs> with those um, values. Yeah, that's great. Um, is there a reason? Uh, sorry, did anybody else have their hand up before I ask them the question? I don't see anybody. Um, so, um, is there a reason why we decided to give um, five hundred to uh, you know eighty four or however many we're giving, as opposed to giving like maybe maybe a thousand dollars would be more would be better um, to and to give to fewer or how did you how did you come to that balance? Yeah, we looked at um, probably like twenty to thirty models across the entire United States based on city size and how large their pool was. Um, the state's pool is um, would be significantly larger than this, although I think they're still determining final numbers. Um, but it, it was really based on knowing many of the applications nationally by um, city entities for this closed early because of overwhelming demand. Um, mm -hmm. And most of those applications ranged from $250 up to about $2,000. And in, in bigger cities, you know, we saw, we saw awards of 10,000 or so. Um, uh, of course, in major metropolitan areas, but um, it, it was a number that that felt doable to serve. You know, the uh, I anticipate we'll probably see the volume of um, uh, hundreds more applications than we'll be able to give out, and and that's been typical of most of these programs. So that's that's how we sort of got there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Is council members, any other questions on the arts um, proposal? Okay, so um, we'll have time to think about that and then we'll do a straw poll at our next meeting. Um, then I do wanna talk a little bit about the, um, the emergency loan program and the breakdown of that. The first thing is, um, well, I'll let you walk us through it, go ahead. Thank you, Council Chair Wharton. Um, so maybe I can just start by expressing appreciation. Um, I know uh, business development ran this program within the department, but it was a much wider effort than just our team. It included other departments. Um, Council Chair, your, su your support in helping review applications was no minor task uh, for the two rounds. And um, we also brought in partners to help with loan processing and reviews. And it was quite a substantial operation to pull off in such a short period of time. I know uh, a special thanks is deserved for the business development staff. Uh, I've said this before and I'll say it again, like it was not uncommon for the team to do 60 to 80 hour weeks during the administration of this loan program. And so, um, you know, uh, I just want to say thanks again um, to all of those who helped administer this. Uh, so we recognize that this was not necessarily a, a, a perfect program. Um, uh, when we did our business survey, we knew one of the biggest factors and what we had to do quickly was administer the, 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 the funding to the businesses for the loan program with the intent of bridging to the SBA program. So we knew that there were going to be, it wasn't going to be perfect and we have some lessons learned, learned definitely that we, if we could do it all over again, we, we would, but we received more than 700 applications. I think the final number was 730 applications. Uh, and, and so we don't want to take a victory lap because we're funding 52 of those. Um, and I think there's a sensitivity to those 680 applications that could not be funded. Um, that we're, we're all very cognizant of and want to address it. I think, you know, the, it's also difficult being, you know, we were first in the state to pull something like this off and shared our resources and every, all the resources that we put together with the wider state and even members outside of the state, other municipalities. Um, we were one of the first in the country, if not the first, I saw some comments from New York City about a loan program before, but I think that may have been the only program that beat us to the punch that I could easily find the state mentioned we were first in the country, but it may have been second. Um, so being a first mover 
um, makes it hard in a lot of ways. So with all that said, we've been through the process on accepting applications, um, putting those applications together for a review committee, reviewing those applications, racking and stacking. And now in the, on the back end process, we have uh, this week, we'll have somewhere between 45 and 50 out of the 52 um, approved applications, uh, the, the funding sent and out the door for those companies. So in terms of speed, those are some of the metrics of success that we were tracking. And that is um, not only a testament to the team and the process on putting together the loan program, but a huge thanks to finance as well. Um, so, you know, we know in terms of lessons learned, we have some things uh, that we put in the transmittal that we know we, we need to give some attention to, um, particularly one of the interesting things that we found and one of the things that um, we'd love to be able to go back and do again is, is we noticed between round one and round two, uh, for example, that our diversity, uh, the, the diverse applications that came in were significantly increased in round two. And there was a timing thing that really uh, came into play, uh, you know, in round one and getting the word out for round two. And so I think a heavy focus on the early side of the loan program, uh, and we even thought about it, and it's a reason why we split it up the way we did uh, to, so that we didn't administer it all at once. That was one of the considerations, and we thought this might be a ramification, but even a more intense effort um, than we already had on what we could have done uh, to reach that population even faster with round one, for example. But we have a, a, a longer list of lessons learned and really we just welcome some feedback or any questions that the council may have on the loan program. And um, would, you know, we, we approach this not to try and defend anything, you know, beyond what shouldn't be, but to be open about, um, you know, uh, the feedback and, and really take a careful look at this and document it in case we do get subsequent rounds of funding um, from either our partnership or from future funding in the city. And so we want to take comments into account and feedback and, and we honestly want to take that in from, from council members to incorporate it. Um, just one thing, looking at the diversity in round one, I think we actually had three um, Hispanic applications. So I want to update that based on what they reported on their applications. What do we have on the chart? Sorry, Two. Pulling. Okay. Um, yeah, that's just something that I was noticing when I was talking earlier with Councilmember Valdemoros about um, our numbers is that I think that's off, but um, the, the other numbers look correct to me. Um, but um, do you have information about um, diversity in terms of the total number of applicants versus the diversity within the awardees? Yes, we have that in the transmittal memo and um, right. we, we captured, so there are three different categories. There's the total applicants, which was about 730. There are the the completed applications, which was in the 300s, and then there were the final approved, which were in the 50s. So um, we had to pull that in information from every individual application. So we only pulled it from the completed applications and the approved ones, because those are the ones we want to really hold ourselves accountable to, to make sure that we're, you know, we didn't have the option to approve applications as a review committee uh, and, and from ones that were incomplete. And so we pulled it from those two numbers. So the 730 isn't captured, but the 300 and some, some odd applications are captured. And one of the data points that we found was both with, um, you know, diversity uh, for eth ethnicity and um, in terms of um, male, female applications, it was pretty consistent from the completed applications to the approved applications. Council Chair, yes, you have that transmittal if you want it shared on the screen. I'm happy to put that up. Oh, um, 
And Ben, unless you want to go through it like step by step, or we can just add less, let council members ask questions. I'm fine with council members um, jumping in and asking questions unless uh, anybody needs more details than what we've already outlined. Um, council member Valdemoros. Hi, Ben. Thank you so much. I have I have a, a few questions. Um, one, and I'm not sure if I'm not finding this right, but I, I would have liked to see a comparison. Um, I know you you guys did a good job showing um, minority or the or the racial diversity and women own, but it would be also nice to compare it to regular white you know white folks that applied for this. Um, and then I would have liked to see, or maybe I actually would see. I, I didn't read it here, but you said there were a total of 330 applications. Um, I know what you did here was the ones that were beat and the ones that were awarded, but it would be helpful to know the total, whether it, whether it was incomplete or not complete. And then out of those incomplete, um, what type of re, you know re, re, outreach do you guys do? How did you communicate with these folks saying, "Hey, your application is incomplete. Uh, we need more information," or, or "Here's a deadline to complete us." Like, was there um, a chance for these folks that had incomplete applications to why or 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 to explain um, the information that was missing? Um, so for the two data points, we, we would be happy to add to what we, um, what we already have and get that information back to the council. As for the complete and incomplete, um, you know, with the 730 applications, it was very difficult to consult with each applicant and say, you know, I'm sorry, uh, here's what you can add, here's what you need to, here's what's missing. Um, so the approach that we took, uh, we knew we had to be consistent across the board. So we got the information out as much as we could that the onus was on the applicant to submit a completed application and that only completed applications would be considered. Um, we put an out of office on the email inbox. Um, we also sent emails out to those who had applied, whether they were complete or incomplete, because we had to get the information out to everyone just to ensure that the applications, to double check their applications um, in between rounds one and two, however, um, we did take a lot of the incomplete applications from round one, and we notified them of the missing elements from their applications. So we couldn't do that, obviously, for round two, because round two closed, um, and we were working with round one applicants to work on completing their applications and notifying them. So we did it for round one, we notified them, but for round two, that just wasn't a possibility um, with the amount of manpower we had for processing the applications. Um, all right, and then would you, would you talk a little bit more about um, how you guys evaluate it? Like what made an, applica an applicant more successful than another one? Well, we have a, a scoring system that we outlined in the transmittal, but the main um, portions were fairly objective for the ratings. Um, one of the things in terms of not saying how people voted because it's a review committee process where the review committee selected the top 25 applicants regardless of score uh, of all of the completed applications. But in terms of getting a score as an applicant, um, the process was fairly simple and it was based on completion. So, for example, one of the things that was requested was narrative. Um, some companies inserted a narrative, but it may have been one or two sentences that said, we're suffering, um, COVID isn't a great thing for our business. And that was the extent of their narrative. So the fact that they included it, they received points, um, but they did not receive, it was a portion of the point total for completion, and it was pretty objective and binary of was it a complete narrative or a partial. Um, and the only other factor really besides completion and completion um, was the, um, the credit score of the company. And 
Um, it was pretty, it was presented to the review committee that that's how this was ranked in that um, the review committee had the ability to select their top applications regardless of credit score or any other factor. Um, so, you know, that may not have factored in uh, to what the review committee had seen for the scoring. And from what I heard from the team, and I didn't go back and do this analysis, but um, what I had heard from the team is just because you got a 100 score uh, and had a complete application didn't mean that you were guaranteed funding. Okay. It, I'm sorry. I, I, sorry, I have more questions. So I heard um, there was something about underwriters looking at these application for, applications first and then giving it to you guys. Um, so the the... I don't, I, I would say that the process was more about completion and less about underwriting and Peter's on the call and can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, but what the committee or what the group was doing in prepping the applications for the committee was ensuring completed packages and putting it in an order that the review committee could easily flip through and understand what the situation was for the businesses because we had so many applications and we're asking so much of the review committee that we wanted to make sure that it was easy um, for the review committee to uh, look at that process. Okay. Um, well, just one, one last thing. I, um, you know, I, I received calls, you know, saying that, you know, may, maybe there were more Hispanic applicants that um, did not um, get approved or we overlooked. And I'm just just looking at your numbers. It looks like a good 23% of the total of the applicants that were Hispanic did receive a loan. But I think I would like to compare that number with the total applications, the very total, what's complete or incomplete, so that we can see like a bigger picture because maybe there is a language barrier or um, some misunderstanding on what it meant to you know to have a complete application or or you know the information that we needed so if we can get that at some point that would be great uh, but thank you for the information that you have here um and i appreciate the guys that you the work that you did and in such quick manner which again the first ones out there to help the small businesses in salt lake city so i'm proud of that thank you well, thank you, and I, I will say I think we have a shared interest in that information, and we'd be happy to put that together and get that back to the council. Um, and I, I would like to say as well, you know, the metric is really tough um, in terms of total awarded um, loans versus the the request for loans, and so we got that. We got we were, the the team worked with some really. Um, difficult emails, I'll say, in terms of responding to people um, throughout the process. And it really was a, a bit of a challenge with that regard across the board, but it is something we want to be sensitive of in terms of, um, you know, the representation and are we are we appropriately distributing it across backgrounds? Um, and that's something that we'll, we'll be happy to look into at a deeper level and get that information to the council. Um, council Member Rogers, you had a question? Yeah, I do. Um, I really appreciate this program and how rapidly you guys were able to implement it. I think it's it's been great um, to be, well, we'll say the first, right, across the nation to get funds to small businesses, right? Um, my question is, I love the the scenario here of lessons learned. And as we look forward, we know there's going to be other grants and funding coming. How would you be able to implement those with your lessons learned and, and you know, the, the mistakes, you not mistakes, but the challenges that you face while doing this? Well, I can tell you already from the onset, one of the things, one of the actions that we've taken as a department is uh, the day after tomorrow, we have our first um, monthly meeting with department leadership and um, the mayor's office uh, representative who would have been really helpful for us to have the collaboration uh, on this diversity element, uh, you know, on the front end, right? Rather than as we're building the plane falling out of the sky. And so um, we have monthly meetings set up now to discuss this and hold ourselves accountable um, prior to, you know, having to 
build the plane while it's falling out of the sky and really be thinking on the front end and proactively about this. And so that's just one quick measure that we've put in place. So we're meeting with Selena Milner um, starting the day after tomorrow and getting together on a monthly basis to review our projects and their projects and how we can be more collaborative on that front. So measures like that, that keep it more front of mind because it's very difficult to do in the moment while you're all hands on deck, building a program like this from scratch. Any other uh, questions on this item, council members? Okay. Well, thank you, Ben. I appreciate it. Um, I, I, I appreciate you guys putting forward um, this information and um, all the work that was put in to, to try to get this out the door as fast as we could and get money in the hands of um, our small businesses. So thank you for putting in the time and please tell your team how much we appreciate um, all the hard work that they put in. Thank you, Council Chair. Okay. Um, Council Member Dugan, would you just raise your hand? No, okay. Um, all right, let's go ahead and move on to item number three, um, which is an ordinance um, for a rezone at 1172 East Chandler Drive. And at the table for this, we have Nick Tarbett in the council office, uh, Mayara Lima, for, uh, uh, principal planner, John Anderson, principal planner, Nick Norris, planning director, and Bruce Baird, uh, Baird applicant representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just give a quick introduction, let Mayara take it from there. As you mentioned, this is a rezone from open space to res to residential foothills. Um, the applicant, Benjamin Dahl, is requesting. He and his representative, Bruce Baird, are here and can answer any questions the council may have. One thing to note is the planning staff has recommended that the rezone be conditioned upon the combining of this property along with the adjacent one at 1174, and the applicant has expressed support for that. So we can uh, let them answer any questions you may have about that, and I'll let Mayara give the background. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. I have a presentation here. Quick presentation. Oh, that's not what I was trying to share. Sorry about that. Let's see. Hi, we did yeah. see your PowerPoint there. Oh, you did? Sorry. Yes. Uh huh. It was showing something different. There it is. Okay. It will refresh in a second. Okay. All right, so um, this is the rezone uh, from OS to FR3. OS is open space, FR3 is Foothills Residential. Uh, it's the property there uh, highlighted. Uh, you can see that it's surrounded by other properties zoned OS and FR3. And um, this property uh, was created uh, in 1983, likely to uh, be used for the adjacent property. Uh, in this picture from 1983, you can see uh, the house built um, and uh, this subject property partially landscaped. Uh, the current owner owns both of the properties and uh, in our records, we see that the, the two properties had been sold together uh, since the creation of this lot. Um, it was likely that this property when it was created also uh, had residential uses permitted. Uh, and right now with the OS zoning district, there are some limitations uh, on what this uh, property could be used for. Um, and that could be a limitation on using for accessory uses for the residential because residential uses are not permitted in the OS zoning district. Um, planning staff is uh, recommending approval, uh, like Nick Tarbett mentioned, um, with the condition that the two lots are consolidated 
the applicant had, had expressed an interest in um, using the lot only for accessory uses and uh, the consolidation would allow them to do that. Um, we have not received any public comments on this um, project, but we feel like uh, the consolidation would mitigate any impact of uh, development on this property. So with the consolidation, only accessory uses and accessory structures would be allowed, but not a principal use. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Okay, this, um... What did you say the applicant's name was? It's Bruce Baird and Ben. Sorry, I can't remember his last name. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> okay. Benjamin Dahl. Oh, okay. I'm trying to think at this property. Um, a big chunk of it um, on the back, or it, it isn't part of the reason why it's open space because it's so uh, vertical. <laughs> Uh, so it's, uh, we assume that that might be one of the reasons why it was zoned OS in 95. Um, so you can see here on this older image, um, the darker part is the landscape area and the other part is the steep slope. Uh -huh. Yeah, so half of the lot is probably undevelopable. Okay. Do you want me to stop sharing the screen? I'm not sure if you, you're done with the images. Um, I'm, I'm, I've got mine uh, pulled up here, so I don't need them, but I don't know if other people do. We'll just wait for a second then. Okay. Um, okay, council members, do we have any questions for planning staff, um, or do we want to give the applicant a minute, or the applicant's representative a minute to talk with us? I don't see any questions, and it's hard to see questions with Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, um, Councilmember Mono. Thanks, Mara. I was, I remember correctly, there is also a unique parcel in that it's zoned open space and the surrounding open space is not owned privately. Am I understand? Am I remembering that correctly? So it's, it's, um, it's on the edge of open space and Foothills residential, but it's also the only open space parcel that is owned by a private resident. Is that correct? Or Am I remembering something different? Um, in that area, it's the only one, but I, I don't know if I would say that it's the only right in that area. Yeah, in that area, I, I believe the surrounding OS properties are owned by the county or the city. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions for planning staff, so we'll go ahead and hear from the applicant or the applicant's representative. Everyone, so everybody can hear me? Yes. First, uh, Ben is on the phone call as well. I wanted to take an opportunity to thank uh, the council and the mayor for uh, all the work you've done to keep us all safe. And if my video is working, I'm, I'm wearing my good hoodie just for you. Um, so. Uh, and drinking a glass of wine, which you can now do at home for these meetings. So uh, we won't keep anybody any longer. We uh, think Mayara and Nick have done a great job. I want to thank the Planning Commission for its unanimous recommendation. I can tell you, um, I was uh, actually the city attorney, uh, assistant city attorney in 95, when the rezoning and the mapping was done, and there were some errors and some private open space was actually was some private property was accidentally owned zoned open space. There was one, for example, near uh, Wasatch Hollow behind where my old house used to be, behind Mayor Wilson's house, uh, which was zoned open space accidentally. And the city uh, fixed that about 10 years ago. Uh, that's all we're asking to do is to fix the uh, private property so it can be zoned for used for uh, only accessory uses. And we're happy to. Uh, Mr. Dahl's happy to agree to enter into a development agreement or whatever other process the city has to go through the, the quote subdivision to recombine the lots so that it would only be used for uh, accessory purposes, just like everybody else's. And we're just here to answer any questions. Otherwise, we think this is a routine and we want to thank you for uh, your quick consideration and let you get back on with more important business. Uh, okay. 
I don't see any other questions. Oh, sorry, Councilmember Rogers. Yeah, maybe Mr. Baird can answer this question for me. Is this uh, the old Garner home up there on Chandler? It is the old Garner home. Okay, thank you. That's Mr. Dahl, by the way, who's the applicant who lives in, that, in the Garner. Hello. Yeah, I did. Um, I thought so. I'm trying to think of who. Did you recently acquire the property, Mr. Dahl? Yes, we acquired the property in the spring from um, uh, Billy Stern. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm pretty sure this is Billy Stern's house. So. Yes, indeed. It was. We're, we're, we're living a, bun a bunch of his improvements, which are fabulous. I know. There, that, there's some really cool stuff in the house. Um, okay, well, um, did this, quick question for me, did this go to the community council and did they have any concerns about it. I don't remember it coming before when I was there, but. My memory is that we did follow the community council process. Uh, Myara did that and noticed it, if I remember correctly. I, I wasn't there, but uh, my memory is it happened in uh, late fall. Yeah, I don't remember any discussion about it, so. We, we, we sent out the notice to the uh, chair of the community council, but they did not request a, meet, a meeting. Okay. Okay. And we understand from uh, Nick what the rest of the process is in terms of your hearing, hopefully on the 5th and then your second reading either a week or two after that. And we appreciate that. And as soon as the uh, rezoning is done, we'll apply for the subdivision and do whatever we need to do for the development agreement. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks so much. I don't think we have any other questions. Oh, council member Dugan. More for this, the uh, staff side of the house is just confirmation that there's no other private owner who owns open space property because uh, that just wants, I just want to make sure that's true. Because that'd be a concern. It, um, I, I'll, I'll let you go, Myra. Uh, it was, I, I, I think we're, you're going back as to uh, the question on the surrounding properties or is that in general? Yes, yes, surrounding. Yeah, the surrounding properties are, well, it's a, a large parcel owned by the city. And then across the street, you have some property that's owned by the county. And there are some privately owned OS uh, property, but across the street, across from Chandler, Chandler Drive, sorry. Okay. All right, thank you. All right. Council members, we will move on to agenda item number four, which is an update and timeline for the city's 2020 2024 consolidated plan guiding the use of US Department of Housing and Urban Development funds follow up. And um, at the table, we've got Ben Lutke, um, the Council Policy Analyst, Lonnie Eggerson Goff, the Director of HAN, Jennifer Schumann, the Deputy Director of HAN, and Tony Milner, uh, the HAN Policy and Program Manager. Council Chair. Yes. Just before you get started, just letting you know that we do have a few documents available for sharing if requested. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess let's go ahead and, and put those up on the screen. So council members, and there's something on the screen, it's, I can't see all of you. So if you will use the hand tool, to raise your hands when there's something on the put up on in front of all of us. Council Chair, is Ben leading off? Yes. Okay. I, I, so. I just have the new staff report and then also the memo from hand available. Ben, are you there? So just to remind the council members, at the last briefing, you unanimously passed a straw poll to add a few priorities to the consolidated plan and asked the administration where those new goals would fit. 
the administration's memo does recommend adding all four of those goals as strategies to the economic development goal. Staff is also working on scheduling small group meetings for the council members who've stated an interest in meeting with the administration about the proposed target areas as well as the concerns related to geographic equity in shifting the target areas. Last night, the administration sent a memo with responses to the council members' questions and requests from the last meeting. Staff forwarded it, forwarded it to the council earlier today. I believe hand staff is here uh, to walk through the memo, or we could jump to specific questions if council members prefer. Um, I want to just start by thanking the um, mayor and the staff um, for hearing what we said and um, and incorporating it into um, an update to this plan. Um, so thank you for doing that. And I do think that there will be some more questions as we go forward with the small group meetings about maybe how these fit in, but um, uh, or how we or how we're fitting these in as strategies. Um, and but I want to give ample time to ask questions. Um, so, are there any questions at the outset? If I don't see any hands raised, so I will go ahead and stay, uh, go ahead and let ham staff go through the memo. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, um, and Ben, um, you've been incredible through this process. Um, I really appreciate the time to talk through this last week. I know that we went way over time and it was very um, helpful to hear council's direction and hear this conversation. So thank you for, for prioritizing it and making the time. Um, some of the things that we heard um, included, um, how can we think about um, education as it relates to early childhood education and promote digital inclusion and address food insecurities. These are our goals that we had in the previous plan that um, fell out of the 2024 plan. So what Hand went back and looked at, um, again, with, with your direction was, are there specific goals that we can align these under and with? And, and what we looked at is revising goal number three to read differently, but still encompass the existing economic development kind of activities, but expand it. Thank you for scrolling down on the screen. I appreciate that. So taking the goal of economic development to expand access to economic mobility and assist small business owners, um, adjusting that to really focus on building resiliency and changing the goal to build resiliency by providing tools to increase economic and or housing stability. Under that, there's a, a bulleted list of strategies that we could encompass, again, providing the council with a menu of options that could be um, utilized as we look at, at applications. So the first two are consistent with what is existing in the proposed plan. However, there's italicized words right at the end that says council could um, again, looking for how can we help provide some flexibility to this body, right? The council could opt to deprioritize the assistance during the first two years while focusing on other economic development activities while Salt Lake City works to recover from the current crisis. Um, so again, just trying to highlight where um, where we identify space where council could kind of make some, um, some shifts or, or provide some flexibility as you think about your decisions. Um, the next bullet, the next two actually are coming um, from a lot of what we're hearing. And I love that Ben from ED was just on talking about how, how the, um, that program has moved forward and how there's so much need in our small business community. And so these two bullet points, and they were topics of conversation at the last one as well, at the last meeting, but really focusing on 
more economic development opportunities. And both of these here, the council could certainly uh, um, think about whether or not you wanted to limit that to two years of the plan or whether you wanted to employ these types of strategies for the entire plan. The last three bullet points are in direct relation to the conversation about providing early childhood education, digital inclusion, and food, addressing food insecurity for vulnerable populations. Those are carryovers from the, the existing plan, then 15, 19, sorry, I had to do math there, um, from the, the current plan and pulling them into, as you said, um, into the 2024 plan. Is there um, any questions about that or any feedback on that approach? I see a thumbs, I like it. A thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you. Just check. Yeah, I don't see anything from council members, so go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you. So as we looked at each of those, we did reach out to different groups to understand better what are the needs that, that others are seeing and how can we um, fully encompass the ideas that, that the council brought forward and identified as, as priorities. So moving on to number two, the target areas in the uh, graphic equity small group meetings. Um, we certainly reached out and that that's working on being, or we are working on coordinating that um, with uh, council schedulers and council staff. So um, small group meetings coming soon. Um, one of the things that we also heard as it relates to the target areas though, um, we looked through this plan and as, as it's presented, we, um, we thought about, you know, certainly leveraging with RDA areas and hearing back from this body. And um, we went back to that to say, you know, is there a way that we can provide some different options for this body to, to think about as we talk about target areas? We know there's not a lot of CDBG funding that'll be limited to these spaces, but it is important to think about how it impacts the community. So um, in the memo, we provided a couple of different um, options for council to consider and a map. And the map uh, was a pretty quick and dirty map. So I wanted to walk through it just really quickly. This is really looking at, can we scroll? Yeah, beautiful. Um, so this is really looking at the density of low income populations in census tracts throughout the city. So you can see that in the center of the Kind of the map, there's dark red. Um, that certainly identifies that 90 to 100 percent of the population that lives there meets um, the 80 percent or below designation that HUD uses. It's also overlaid with the RDA um, project areas, so you can see where those income densities kind of align with the project areas. So we thought this kind of a map might be helpful as you think about how do we leverage and target. Uh, funding in this space. And then we talked about in the memo, we talked about four potential options to, to use as you think about how to identify CDBG target areas. One um, target area option number one is really to just think about like the as it's proposed in the plan. That is certainly an option. Um, we certainly heard back that we wanted to Think about that a little differently though. So the next one, the next option talks about maybe limiting or prioritizing activities to the newest RDA project areas, including State Street, Nine Line, and North Temple. Um, and that would further target funding to the areas that maybe don't have the many, many years of RDA investment and where we're looking to have some rapid um, changes occur. Option three steps outside of the RDA, the existing RDA project areas, and really uses boundaries to help identify um, a potential option. So option three is kind of a smaller area, and option four is a much larger area. So these were just options that we thought we, we could bring forward that would give the council maybe some other considerations than just simply looking at the, RD, the existing RDA project areas. I'd like to pause there and see if there's any direct questions on on that. Uh, no, I don't. I don't see any. So go ahead. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Um, the next part of the memo talks about COVID relief funding and um, we're really excited to be for better or for worse, right? To be um to be able to access um, federal funding that's coming through COVID relief funds. Um, we are learning every single day on um, what this means and what it looks like. And there's a separate designation for three grants: CDBG. You'll notice the CV designation. So CDBG, CV, ESG, CV, and Hopwa CV. Um, there is still a lot of information that's coming out. Very, very much so on a day, day by day basis about how we can utilize these funds. And so we are in hand, we are looking, working very closely to identify what options, what kind of flexibility and uh, propose a clear and transparent process that follows HUD's requirements in accessing these funds. We do know that there are waivers that are coming out. And even today there was an additional webinar to talk about um, the waivers that are coming through. And those waivers are talking are, are really pushing towards how do we how do we increase flexibility? So more information is coming out, and as we as we are able to wrap our heads around this quickly moving thing, um, we will certainly be in conversation with um, not only the mayor's office but the council as well. Um, I think the next question talks specifically about um, consolidated plan requirements and. Um, and whether or not uh, we can maybe reduce the plan itself. And um, I'm here to um, identify that we have, we have created a, a proposed plan that meets all of HUD's requirements. And if anyone wants to nerd out with us, I gave you a link that goes to um, a, a 319 page document that talks about all of the requirements um, and then like a how to a little bit on, on the consolidated plan. So we have not gone above and beyond the minimum requirements of the plan. We've certainly um, recognized that there's a lot of information that HUD requires um, as we as we evaluate what the needs are within the community and, and present a plan forward. I do believe that the rest of the questions on the memo respond more to the 2021 applications. And so I don't know if you want to talk about those now, or if you want to save that for the next agenda item, which is discussing those applications. Um, let's make sure we don't have any questions on this first. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Councilor Romano. I'm just wondering where this memo is. You probably already said it. It's, it wasn't, was it in our, is it in our packet somewhere? I couldn't find it in the packet, but it is in our email. It's in our, okay, thanks. For today at 10 a.m. So, um, council members, I don't see any other hands up. Um, I have a question. Yes, council oh, members. Jennifer, I really liked your map. I'm a map guy, so that map is great, and it would be nice if we could put that map up and put your for your options on the overlay of that map because I was trying to go back and forth between the targets or options three and four because it it really paints a good picture here with the colors and the RDA uh, areas, and maybe your um, your options can help out. Just for me. Um, I believe it's Cindy Lou who is sharing her screen. Oh, right. Yeah. And yeah. I apologize. I couldn't make it all fit on one page. Super easy to read side by side. It's, it's a lot of information. Oh, no, it's, it's great information. I just. The outline of your, your tart, your uh, options would be great on that map. If possible. I am certainly happy to do that and send it back um, to council staff and council members. Yeah, just just the map itself. Sure, happy to do that. Very nice. Job. Um, council members, other 
Other questions just on the hand map itself, or the, not sorry, not the hand map, the, here's my question. Um, we're gonna have a conversation about the in-between, um, and I think we've all gotten a lot of, um, of inquiries from, um, from members of the community about the in-between. Um, if we wanted, if the council wanted to fund the in-between, would we have to find a way to also make that a strategy in the HUD plan? Or can we have our HUD plan and then we also fund just this other organization that's not really in the plan? Um, Tony Milner is going to jump in and uh, electronically throw something at me if I misspeak here. Um, the in-between is an eligible project. So as the plan is um, currently presented, the expansion of goal number three um, does not change that. So the council has absolute ability to fund the in-between. Okay. Um, and um, similar question for uh, is the same true for, I just want to ask council members when we get to our CDBG, CDBG discussion about another um, applicant that wasn't recommended for funding. So that would be the same, that would be true for that funding or that applicant as well, right? Um, can you tell me which application you're referring to? And um, Journey of Hope. I'm going to um, throw an audible to Tony because okay. I don't have that in front of me. <laughs> Mr. Milner, would you mind stepping in and responding to that? Yeah, Journey of Hope's application is currently eligible for to be recommended for funding. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, just to sort of, um, I, I appreciate the, the different options that the um, administration has has given us um, there are these different alternative plans um, and I wish that um, Andrew could be here with us too to to give his input on the alternatives that have been presented um, for me just so that council members know where I'm at is that I do really want to focus on the low income areas um, so I would like to see us prioritize um, I want to do that. I, I want to focus on that because I think residents need to see meaningful improvement in their neighborhoods, in these um, underserved neighborhoods. And um, so I'm thinking about um, looking more at the red and orange areas um, or saying that, you know, we'll tie them to um, I think it was one of the first, I think it's the first alternative saying that we'll tie it to some of the RDA areas, but I just want um, council members to, to know where I'm at and hopefully get, uh, I'd like to hear from you. And I think the administration would like to hear from you about what your feelings are on the alternatives so that we can continue to move this conversation forward um, and continue uh, so that we can meet our May deadline um, and not just, just push it off because um, uh, because Andrew's not here. Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, I don't know who said that. Was it Darren? Uh, yes. So, um, I'm also interested in focusing on low, lower income areas. Uh, I've thought about it a lot the last few days. I, there's some, things about the RDA areas that make sense to me um, in that we can leverage multiple departments and multiple funding sources to focus on an area. One of my concerns with the new RDA project areas, um, or one I hope not unintended consequence is that since they are so large, I think it's hard to make um, as meaningful of an impact in those areas. And so, layering on the hand and HUD financing um, may be a way to mitigate that, to make a bigger impact in specific areas. Um, so that my, I, I could go with the idea of 
choosing specific RDA project areas that also happen to be low income and selecting a few of those. Um, also the two, I think, to me, the two areas that um, are here, the option three and four, well, I wanna say, I wanna advocate for option three because it's my neighborhood and it's district five. It seems like it would make more sense if it was between those two to also include out to Redwood Roads. So I, I think really in terms of East-West equity, just focusing on this area between I-15 and State Street makes maybe a little less sense than going out to Redwood to me, just because I think the area between I-15 and State Street already will get a lot of investment. Um, so if we're not going to tie it to project areas, I would, I would kind of think option four seems a little more equitable across the board. But those are just my initial thoughts. And I didn't see it in my email this morning, so I just barely am looking at it now. So it's not a very thought through response. Anyone else want to chime in? Okay. Councilmember Fowler. Thanks. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I think it, and it should always be a goal of ours to um, make sure that any funding or programs are being distributed you know, equitably and to focus on our low income and more affordable income housing, um, because we know that that's the areas that we need. I just want to, I just want to make sure we're not tying our hands too tight behind our back. And part of the idea of including some of those other goals from last week when we said, hey, what about education? What about digital? Um, divide and, and what about health and having the administration go back and say how can we incorporate these concerns so that we did have flexibility flexibility and so I guess for me I would rather I, I recognize that we kind of do have to have targeted areas but I also I think, I don't know, I'm, I think that we should just be a little careful of, like I said, tying our hands too tight behind our back and not giving us flexibility, knowing that our priority are going to be in certain areas. But what if there is a great project or a great thing in two years from now that's just outside of one of those targeted areas? Um, and then, but if we had expanded to all of the RDA areas or all of these things, then then we'd be able to provide that. Um, so I, I just want to caution us to, to make sure that if there's a way to create flexibility, but with the understanding that the priority is what we what was just mentioned between the, the chairperson and, and council member Mano, that that might be a good idea as well. So don't have an input as far as which option just saying want to be cautious of limiting us too much well we do have to have targeted areas right identified. is that right correct yes but then they um but that's only for capital improvements and transit related we can still have like a great program that isn't you know, that's that's not housed in one of the areas. Absolutely. Like, you know, for like the in-between, for example, regardless of, of what other concerns there might be, like it's not in any of the target areas, but we could still choose that or we could still choose to fund that and, and we wouldn't be sort of out of compliance with the plan that we're contemplating right now. That is correct. And if I may um, add just a little bit more, um, maybe this helps with that flexibility idea. Um, you could most definitely identify which area you want to work in and then prioritize those areas. So you could, um, for example, if it was RDA areas, just because that's the easiest to show this example on, um, you could prioritize for years one, two, and three a specific area. That doesn't mean that if 
if a project comes about in a different RDA area that it's completely off the table, it's just you're going to prioritize the most of the funding to these specific areas that you identify and then evaluate anything else outside of that on a more annual basis. Mm -hmm. So that could be, and that doesn't necessarily have to be tied to RDA areas. It could even be if you're doing um, a larger, what more west west side focused um, target area, we can we can break that into quadrants where we are really focused in certain on certain years in certain spaces, and that might again help identify some flexibility for for council to address these kinds of questions. Okay. Um. James, I hate to call you out, but yesterday or last meeting, you said something that really resonated with me that you said that, you know, North Temple um, has been an RDA area for eight years now, and it's never been worse. Um, how do you feel about the, um, the, the alternative um, that the mayor is proposing? Do you feel like that addresses or gives us enough to address what uh, you perceive are the problems that are are holding us back on North Temple. You mean target specific? Well, just Tar like, do you, do you think we could use the alternatives that the mayor is suggesting to alleviate that problem and other examples on the west side? I, I absolutely think it's a great start, right? And I think it for me, there's a there's many components to it, but this is absolutely one that will help address that. But there's other things that we're you know we're going to be discussing like. What we just did in the RDA with housing fact finding with that uh, increment. So there's a lot that, you know, moving forward that is going to help complement this. But this is the number one start, I think. Okay. Do you have a preference about um, the different options? You know, I, I need to go back and look at the email that was sent today because I did not see that. I missed that completely. And what okay. time was that at? Was that at 10:20? You said. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, did I, Anna? Did I see you had your hand up for a minute, Councilman yes. I, I just had a question on. Let's say, let's say we, like, we go with Jen. What you were saying? Okay, we're gonna prioritize certain areas. They match with the RDA, but then we can, if a project comes up somewhere else that wasn't on our plan that we told had. Um, we do it, and then all of a sudden we're doing a lot of projects not in the that that are outside these areas. Will will we get penalized by HUD or um, I mean, is there any problems that you could foresee if we do something like this? If we're all of a sudden we're leaning somewhat, not necessarily all you know, all all wrong, but when when we say well we're going to focus on these areas, and then all of a sudden half of our projects are not in the areas that we told them. Sure, what is, what is the risk, right? What is the risk that, that we run afoul at federal regulations? So what HUD is going to say is any infrastructure projects that we undertake have to occur within the target area. So if you make the target area a little bit larger, um, and then you say, you know what, in years one, two, and three, we're gonna prioritize in these three spaces. And years four and five, we're going to maybe then explore whether or not we're done in one, two, and three and move to four and five, right? So then it's not that projects are happening outside of the target area. It's just you're even further targeting inside the target area, but you're able to identify a large enough space to where there's flexibility over those five years to where if a amazing project comes up and it's in an area that isn't necessarily a priority area, but you feel strong enough about it, you can still, uh, you can still, sorry, you can still do the project there, but recognizing that it wasn't one of the pri priority areas within an already restricted area. Does that help? It, it, it does, if we have an expand about one, let's say, let's say it's not within that expanded one, but it's still in an area that has, you know, that, that complies with the AMI um, uh, requirements. That's my question. Like, if we all of a sudden start leaning towards there, and then they look at our projects, and they're like, well, you said this other area is not. 
<laughs> what's going on here? So the answer How to that would in be trouble. No. Okay. Yeah, we, we will absolutely get ourselves in trouble. So it has to be within the identified target area that's okay. in the plan. All right. Um, what about in Amy's scenario? How hard is it? Let's say there's, you know, we've set these boundaries and then there's one that's just outside the boundary that we're like, oh, I wish that we had included it there. Is, uh, is that part of amending the plan? If it's something small like that, just like a boundary adjustment, does that require a lot of work? As, um, yeah. Staff? Yeah, that does require an amendment to the plan. Um, there's always that question though, right? Like, there's always going to be a project just outside. There's always going to be just not quite enough funding. Um, in, in this case, uh, it would require an amendment of the plan to be approved by HUD before we can commit any dollars to it. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Are there any other questions or comments on this part before we move to CDBG? All right. See. Nice work, Jennifer. Thank you. <laughs> thank you thank you so much for um for this memo and um thank you in advance for the small group meetings that we're about to have. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's go to agenda item number five: one year action plan for community development block grants and other federal grants for fiscal year 2020 2021. Um now we had to um we were going through these one by one and we had to stop because of time issues so um we'll go back and resume where we left off with ben uh ledke from council policy or from council office um Bonnie anderson goff director of hand jennifer schumann deputy director and tony milliner uh, policy and program manager Were we going through the, yeah, we were going through the big one, and I don't remember what page we were on, Ben. Page 11, we right. got through all of CDBG at the last briefing. So there's ESG, Home, and Hopwa to still go through, and it starts on page 11. Okay, great. Okay. Would you like that on the screen, Chair? Um, no, because I want to be able to watch for hands. Um, and I know everybody's got their big printout anyway. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, how were we doing this before? I was reading them and then we were asking questions, I think. Um, so I'll go ahead and just do that um, again. So under uh, on page 11, starting with number one is Catholic Community Services, the Weekend Homeless Resource Center, operational support um, and for the day shelter. Um, first step house, um, on-site behavioral health assessment, referral and peer support services to individuals at the Men's Homeless Resource Center, uh, shelter the homeless, um, is requesting ESG funding to assist with the utilities for the two new homeless resource centers in Salt Lake City. The road home operational expenses for St. Vincent DeFall dining hall is overflow for the winter um, emergency shelter. Number five is Valley Mental Health for providing outreach services, including increased daily living activities, uh, locate housing, obtaining income, medical insurance, and connecting to treatment. Number six, Volunteers of America, operational and service expenses for the uh, Geraldine King Women's Resource Center. Seven, Volunteers of America, operational uh, for essential services at the VOA Youth Shelter. And YWCA, supporting low-income women and providing resources necessary to improve well-being advanced uh, economically, advanced economically and obtain permanent affordable housing. Council members have any questions about any of the applicants under 
of this section. Councilmember Valdemoros. Yeah, I wonder if the WYCA um, has applied for um, has applied for a um, grant somewhere else in another part of this city. Do you remember? Um, I am looking right now. Thank you. So I can answer that. So Tony Milner here. Um, so they. The ones we're looking at right now for ESG are related to the so the one that for oh, I just lost it. So this is their residential self sufficiency program. So this would actually be rent assistance. No, excuse me. This is like shelter operations. Where the other one they applied for CDBG funds it would be more case management related. Do they have they applied for any um, rental assistance for their um, for their clients? Do you know, Tony? I mean, I I I felt like the last time I talked to them, they said that they had availability um, in terms of housing, but they did not have enough funding to help cover for this housing. And looking at the statistics on domestic violence month since we've had this pandemic, I, I feel like this group um, used that help, but the, the, but the women that they service, um, that they help could use some housing, you know, to, to get away from dangerous situations like domestic violence. Yes, uh, not in this round of funding, they've applied through other sources, um, such as funding our future. Mr. Chair, a follow up on that. What was the total with the funding their future in last year's CDBG money compared to this year? Um, uh, if you give me a few moments, I'm happy to hunt that unless Lonnie's got that at her fingertip. Lonnie, Sorry. we can't, we can't, whoever was just talking, I think, I don't know if it's Jennifer or Lonnie, but we could. It was Jennifer. Yeah, she's having some uh, interactivity uh -huh. issues. I apologize. I think um, for Clarity, Council Member Roger Clarity, you were asking about funding our future. Uh, we we did have an application from YWCA for sixty thousand dollars under that um, mechanism, and I just I think I was hearing some confusion about whether it was CDBG or funding our future. It was funding our future. But last year's CDBG was thirty seven thousand, right? Correct. So they had a total of like ninety seven thousand dollars funding between the two. And this year, we don't funding our futures. Do we know how much is going to be allocated to them? That is part of their 20 year FY year for year 20. I see what you're saying. I see why it came out to 93. That makes more sense to me now. I'm understanding that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, council members, any other items on this section? Or should we move on to the next section? Okay, and we will move on to page 13. Um, this is homeless prevention, rapid rehousing. Um, and I'll just go ahead and read these again really quickly. At Housing Authority of Salt Lake City to assist individuals and families to prevent eviction through rental assistance, rental arrears, and associated fees. Uh, Salt Lake Community Action, DBA is Utah Community Action, Diversion Program Support in the form of salaries and operational support. Diversion is a light touch approach to working uh, to find safe alternatives for clients rather than entering into shelter. Salt Lake Community Action, DBA, Utah Community Action, providing case management support for individuals experiencing homelessness through deposit and rental assistance and holistic case management. For the road home um, salary and support for case managers at the road homes rapid rehousing program. 
um, and five, Valley Mental Health, providing rapid rehousing to individuals who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Any questions on anything under this section? I don't see any hands. So we will go forward to um, Salt Lake City Home Program. Um, and I'll read these categories again. Uh, Utah Community Action, Operational Support, Direct Client Rental Assistance through Tenant-Based Rental Assistance. Um, two, Community Development Corporation of Utah, direct aid in the form of grants and loans not to exceed each the first time um, to low to moderate income home buyers in Salt Lake City for down payment assistance. The road home uh, tenant-based uh, rental assistance for eligible clients. Uh, Salt Lake City Housing and Neighborhood Development, funds used for development activities, including acquisition, new construction, rehabilitation of existing housing. Housing Authority of Salt Lake, um, funding uh, to acquire the Gateway Inn Motel. Um, 1,500 Temple 4 LLC, funds for construction of multifamily housing. And that's it. Oh, well. Then on the next page, just for administration, we have um, Salt Lake City Housing uh, Neighborhood Development funding to administer the home program. Any questions on any of those council members? Okay, I don't see any. Moving on to Papua. Um, number one is Housing Authority of the County of Salt Lake, aka Housing Connect, uh, rental assistance for HOPWA eligible tenants and staff salary support program administration. Second um, is from Utah County Action Program, salaries and operational support and re uh, rental assistance for HOPWA housing program. Third is the Utah AIDS Foundation salary and support for case manager to provide housing related case management to people with HIV or their household. And number four, Salt Lake City Corporation to provide management oversight and monitoring of the Hopper program. Any questions on Hopla? Okay, I don't see any. So now we've gone through all of it, um, but we did get some additional information about the in-between. So do we want to jump back to that section? That is... Um, Section and public services section, which begins on page five. Um, I'm trying to pull up the in between information. So, um, Council Chair. Yes, sorry. I believe it's on page eight, line 26. Thank you. Page eight, line 26. Um, okay, so I know we just got this information recently, um, uh, this morning, so people may not have had time to review it, but do people want to raise, uh, do we want to have a discussion right now about the in-between um, based on what the, the questions were that were raised in our last meeting, or do council members want to um, wait and go through that in small groups? What would you all prefer at this point? Councilmember Dugan. I, I looked through it quickly this, this afternoon and uh, takes a little bit more time to digest. And so I think it might be better to do a small group on the journey of hope and the in-between. Okay. And I'm not sure which line the item the journey of hope is, but uh, I think a small group would probably be wise to do those. Okay. I'm wondering, and I, I'm sorry I didn't ask this last time, um, but I was uh, wondering based on um, 
the comments that we received at the formal meeting, which was after we asked the administration to come back with some information about the in-between. But can we get some um, additional information on Journey of Hope and why that was not recommended by the committee for funding? Sure, Council Chair, we can provide that. Okay, I would like to just go over that in my um, in in my small group meetings. Um, but um, just remember, council members, that we you, you know there are a couple applicants are on here that are new that um, where funding's been recommended where um, we could reallocate some of that. Um, back if we decide if once we decide on through the in between information if we decide that we want to provide the same funding that we did in previous years which i think was uh 40 49 000. let's see 45 599. okay um any other questions on um cdb so uh this is not Let's see, our last, our next meeting will be the last opportunity to do the straw polls on this, and then we'll be voting to finalize. So if council members decide, I just want to say for the new people, um, if you decide that there, that we want to change funding around, you should come prepared to the next work session meeting with a proposal of where you want to take money and why you want to take from one pot and put it in another pot. Um, and that's the point where we'll do straw polls about um, whether or not we're supportive of that and then um, move forward with the vote. So um, I hope that if there, if there is an interest in, in changing any of the funding recommendations that you'll come prepared with those recommendations um, and um, sort of a little mini presentation for the rest of us at the next meeting. Mr. Chair. Right. Yes, Councilmember Fowler. May, I just wanted to clarify something you said, because I remember going through this my first time and it was confusing. Um, so for the newer council members, it's, I think it's maybe a little bit clear to say, move from one program to another program, because the money in each pot has to stay in that pot, meaning you can't take CDBG money and right. move it over to ESG. You can't take ESG money and move it to HOPWA. So, as right. the council members are maybe looking at things that are trying to move it around, the money has to stay in the pot, but it can go to a different program. Is yes, correct. Yeah, that was confusing to me when I first did this. I wanted to clarify that. Yeah, yeah. great reminder, council member. That's a great yes. reminder. But within the pots, that it continue. So it's more of like they we can move within the pots, but they have to be on the same stove. So the ESG stove is off limits to the CDBG stove. So, okay. Um, okay, uh, any other, or any questions or anything else anybody wants to add on this? Okay, great. Let's move on to agenda item number six, which is a break. Um, and we're a little bit early, so everybody gets a full hour um, for dinner. Um, and then we will reconvene at seven o'clock for our, um, uh, let's see, hold on. Uh, we'll reconvene for our um, ordinance on shared housing zoning text amendments or formerly SROs and our information on the chart of council tools and for our limited formal meeting. So council members, we're going to, um, normally we we would start a new uh, WebEx meeting for our formal meeting. We won't be doing that this time. So if everybody will just mute and put your, uh, mute yourselves and take turn your cameras off for the hour, um, we'll come back, we'll hit those last two agenda items, and then we'll do the formal in this same meeting without starting a new meeting. Okay, thank you all.
Welcome back, everybody, um, for the last two items on our City Council work session agenda and for our limited formal meeting. Item number seven on the agenda is an ordinance related to shared housing zoning text amendments, formerly known as uh, single room occupancy or SROs. Um, uh, presenting to us today, we have Russell Weeks, uh, policist with the uh, council office, Nick Norris, planning director, Ashley Ogden, RDA project manager, and Wayne Mills, planning manager. Russell, go ahead and start us off. Well, this is uh, this is a long time coming. Uh, as you know, um, this is a, a briefing about uh, 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 amendments to the a proposed ordinance that the that the council discussed uh, uh, at least from November nineteenth uh, of last year, and uh, it 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 deals with three things. One is 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 it uh, addresses the term shared occupancy, which uh, better defines what I the council and the rest of the city are trying to achieve with this proposal um and it, it's called shared housing i'm sorry and it uh, deletes single room occupancy from the uh from the uh zoning uh code and it uh contains a section in title a title titled accessibility that uh, says all areas of shared housing development shall be designed to be universally accessible as required by applicable federal and state laws that is a a result of of meeting uh, of meetings between council members planning uh division staff and uh, housing advocates and i i think i'll turn it over to nick norris uh because he's he's worked pretty hard on this thing Thank you. This is Nick. I don't really have much to add um, and can entertain some questions. There is one thing that I think needs to be corrected in the, the staff report. Um, there's a discuss the top paragraph, there's a discussion about where um, the zoning districts are and how many acres of land are east and west. And the staff report mentions I-15. I believe it's supposed to be I-15. Just a, a quick clarification, but other than that, I'm I'm open to any any questions that the council has. Okay, um, council members, um, any questions? Yes, Dan Dugan, Councilmember Dugan. Just one simple question: Are these non-smoking areas, or can you smoke in your uh, room, house? Um, that would. That would be up to the individual management of, of the, the building. Of the building. I was just wondering if there's a, a a state code on no smoking in, you know, in that area, in that type of a building. Yeah, I I don't know the answer to that. We we can look it up certainly and and provide that. Just curious more, I guess. Councilmember. Thanks. Yeah, um, Nick, first of all, thanks for providing that clarification. I was confused about the 215 thing and it didn't quite make sense. So appreciate that. Um, a couple things. Um, one, the term universally accessible. To me, as an architect is confusing because there's kind of two different terms that are used a lot. One is universal design and one is accessible design. And universal design goes far beyond I think what was written was legally required by codes or however it's written. Universal design goes far beyond that. So the term universally accessible to me kind of uh, like makes me think that I have to go some, somehow beyond the, the laws as written. Um, so to, I, I think that's kind of confusing and I, I'd like to clarify the the goals of that because if the goals are to go above and beyond what would be required anyway then um it seems to me like it needs to be clarified yeah so that i believe that term came from 
um, HUD's guidelines for universally accessible um, buildings. And so the intent was to comply with the federal regulations that apply to that. It wasn't necessarily to go above those. It was just to make sure that um, at the minimum those are complied with whether or not a proposal is um, subject to the HUD requirements funding or not. Okay, I think that to me that's not clear in the ordinance then that it has to be it has to meet HUD guidelines regardless of whether they're they're requesting HUD financing or whatnot. So um, I guess I would I, I think that it probably needs to be clarified, but I would at least want some response to why it's written that way because um, it seems like when it says and I should have gotten this before, but when it says um, to meet federal laws, that to me just sounds like IBC and ADA code, which would be less than universal design. Yeah, so the, pro the issue that we had is that there's a number of different standards and guidelines. So not just HUD, but there's also um, some FHA, some Fair Housing Act guidelines and some other things. And so we didn't want to just limit and start listing specific laws and regulations that they'd have to comply with, because then we were afraid we were leaving something out. And so that's why we wrote it the way we did, um, so that they would have, that this type of housing would have to apply or have to comply with all applicable federal and state laws. Okay, I guess I still, I still think it doesn't say that because it says as required by applicable and state laws, which to me, depending on the type of unit it is, it could be only IBC and ADA codes that would require that. And I think it, it seems like it could be, maybe this is a, a lawyer question, I don't know, but it seems like it could be argued that if HUD, if we're trying to meet, have them meet HUD standards, but the project doesn't doesn't require that project or doesn't have doesn't oversee that project that it would um, it could be argued by the applicant that I don't have to do that because HUD doesn't require me for this project. I'll I'll leave it at that. Okay. Yeah. It's. I mean, we can talk to the attorneys about how to write it and um, do that. But so there's HUD requirements that apply, and then there's the Fair Housing Act requirements that would apply to every housing over a certain number of. Um, sleeping rooms or dwelling units. So that, that's kind of how we're trying to deal with this is that it's not just one or the other. There's multiple that can apply in multiple situations. So I'm happy to circle back with, with the city attorney's office and try to figure out the, the correct wording. Okay. Um, oh, we're getting a thumbs up from Katie Lewis, city attorney. Thank you, Katie. Um, Council members, any other questions on this? Council member Baldomoros. Hi, Nick, just to, just to go um, back to the things that happened, if, if we change anything, one, shared, now we're gonna call them shared housing instead of single occupancy room, right? Um, we're going to allow it in more zones than what we had. Is that, is that correct? There's more zones now, right? That they're allowed, or has it always been like this? No, I think it's pretty much the same as prior to November. One of the reasons why we haven't expanded that is that that would be something that we'd have to go back through the process with. We wanted to add new zoning districts, and based on the briefing in November, um, I'm, I think the direction was that let's move forward with what we have. And then if we want to expand this to other areas, that would be a, a follow-up process. Okay, great. Thanks for the clarification. And then the other thing is, do we limit the, do we limit this kind of housing in certain districts or are we not going that direction? Sorry, you cut out a little bit on the limit. Are we limiting from, the, from a the, unit perspective? Yeah, from like the amount of units of this type of housing that we will have in each of this. Zoning district. We're not. We, we are relying on the, the bulk and mass regulations of the underlying zoning. Um, and that's primarily because the districts where we're putting this, where we're 
housing this for the most part don't have any kind of density requirements anyways okay with the exception of some of the rmu zones but um we think this is more in line with multifamily in those zones which also don't have the density limitations and so that that's why it's also one of the reasons where we're gonna one of the reasons why we didn't include the rmf zones because those do have density restrictions for for multifamily and we haven't figured out um, how that would work with this type of housing. And so moving forward, so once, if we approve this, are, are you going to be tracking um, in some way on how this development is happening and issues that we foresee or not and things are looking great and then we want to expand to other zones? Uh, it's our intent to track uh, what happens. Um, I think it's going to be fairly easy and, and not very time consuming for this type of housing because I don't anticipate um, the city seeing a lot of this type of development going on. Right. I, I just hear, I have, I have to, you know, for my constituency, there's a group that really wants them and they want everyone citywide and others that are happy as is or, or not as happy, but, um, but they prefer this method. So I should to see um, in the future after we get some built out, see what happens. So thank you, that's it. Um, any other questions, council members? Okay, um, seeing none, um, well, thank you so much for your work on this, um, Nick Norris and your team, and thank you, Russell, for, um, for your presentation and your briefing on this issue. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, thanks. Have a good night. You too. Council members, we'll move on to the last item on our work session agenda, which is an Mr. Mr. Oh. Chair, I think I think Amy and Dan might have both had questions. I could be wrong. Oh, did you? Amy. I'm sorry. No. No, nope. Dan. Oh, okay. Never okay. mind. Sorry. My, sorry. No problem. That's okay. I actually think. Oh, did we lose? Nick Norris, I thought James had a question for him, but I'm, I'm still in my bunker. <laughs> okay. James, did you have a question? No, oh, no, I just was wondering how the bunker was treating him. So, <laughs> so I'm actually in my garage. So I, 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 the, uh, I was the rest of, the rest of the house. <laughs> we have guitar lessons going on and other things. So this this has actually been a quite nice place to work. That's awesome. <laughs> This is awesome. And I was right, I guessed that. <laughs> Thanks. All right, thank so, you. Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, so my takeaway from this then is that uh, there's going to be a revised ordinance to make it to clarify uh, Council Member Mano's issue, and then the Council is going to act on, uh, formally consider this item. Is that correct? Um, a public hearing? Yeah. So, not nothing further today, though. Right. Right. Okay. So, re sorry, Russell. What was, what was your question? So, oh, I'm sorry. Is this a two-step process then? A revised ordinance and a public hearing, or well, or just revise the ordinance? Russell, unless we've already had the public hearing, this is a land use issue that would require. Yeah. A hearing. So I think the answer is both. There, there'll be some revisions um, based on the information that we've gotten today, and then we'll set it for public hearing. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Russell. Okay, we'll move on now to the item number eight, which is an informational item um, on council tools. And if you'll look at the... Um, Last item in your packet, um, Cindy Gus Jensen, the um, Council Executive Director, and Jennifer Bruno, the Deputy Director, are going to lead us through this discussion. So, okay, thank you. And Cindy Lou will put up the chart. Oh, perfect. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so basically, this this chart you've all seen it before, but we are just uh, going through it now um, as a follow up to what you were um, talking about at your retreat in terms of, um, trying to make it bigger, sorry. 
um, in terms of keeping up on all the tools and the policies and that type of a thing. So um, common sense stuff um, going into the budget though might be helpful. So we, across the top, um, you'll see that the the first set of items are sort of the resources and some options. And then um, we've got a, a line uh, that's a little darker uh, that separates into the formal actions. So then um, down the side of the chart, we have the number of council members and, and what can be achieved with one person, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And um, the shading is intended to show sort of the weight of what can happen with more people. So I will just start with um, item, the first item, which is uh, one council member and what they can achieve. And if, if you don't wanna go through all of this, that's fine, just stop me, okay? Um, I won't go into too much detail, but um, basically as an individual council member, you can suggest anything, you can inquire about anything, you can recommend anything, request anything, advocate for anything. Uh, you can communicate with your constituents, uh, collaborate with other council members, with the administration, other local government, um, state of Utah, private sector, all of those things. And um, there are a few council policies that um, would come into play to overlay that. Um, for example, uh, the chair speaks for the council, so you wouldn't want the legislature and uh, work with a sponsor to file some legislation and then speak on behalf of the council. So, so all of these things are um, overlaid with um, with the group, kind of your group norms and and your council policies. Um, then, beyond that. Um, you have the more formal items and, well, well, I guess I should say, um, if you get two or three people, there are a few more things that you can do. You can have more time, more staff time, if you have more council members in the conversation, and you can um, also begin to request work on a citywide issue. If you get up to three council members, then you can um, ask to have a the council consider a petition uh, asking for some land use action or that type of a thing. And I don't wanna minimize what you can do as, a, as an individual because you can do a lot, especially if what you're doing is collaborating uh, with your, your peers on an informal basis, collaborating with the, uh, the mayor and the department heads. Uh, so there's a lot you can do, but in terms of actually getting an appropriation or an ordinance passed, then you need to get to four. So um, then that's where, yes, if you could scoot it up a little bit, um, you can do um, really any budget allocation or any ordinance adoption with four council members. Uh, the reason it's always nice to have five, and this does not come up very often, but it does occasionally, that um, a super majority of the council or five council members can override a mayoral veto. And it also tends to give the public a little more uh, of where the council's coming from. Uh, you can sometimes uh, read articles uh, in, from the past about a four to three split or a four to three vote. Um, and, and really what it means is that it could even be brought back the next week uh, by someone on the prevailing side and the vote could be different. So the more council members you get, the more um, effective it's, it's more of a solid um, situation that you have created. Um, so really, by the time you get to having seven council members, um, it's it's veto proof. It sends an extremely clear message to the to the public about what you are interested in. It reduces the likelihood that um, people will will um, 
sort of lobby and try to get you to reconsider something. Um, but there's nothing at all that makes it necessary to have seven people on everything or six or five. Um, there are times when it's possible to have five council members vote yes on an action and then have a mayoral veto and you could have one or more of the council members change their mind in whether to to override the veto. So um, anyway, the whole point of this chart is that in order to take formal action, you um, you need partners and you um, you can get farther the more you have and the more that you are able to keep each other informed, give it give each other a heads up that type of thing. And um, as um, as far as I should say one other thing about once you have a majority of four, the overlay for that is um, that what you would like to do has to be um, within the constitution, um, within the state and city statutes, um, and um, within separation of powers. Uh, but one thing to remember is that once you have four people, you can change the city ordinances. So once in a while, um, you'll you'll have the feedback, well, this, the ordinance doesn't allow that. But if you have four people who are interested or in a, in a briefing session, if you have uh, realized that there are four people interested in it, you can then um, begin to be more confident in the possibility of an ordinance change. So. That is the extent of the tools briefing. I'm happy to um, gather your questions and get assistance from the attorney's office as necessary or answer the ones that I am able to. And Jennifer is here and Lehua also if you have um, questions that they may be able to address. Council members, um, any questions on Council tools, um, anything like that. Okay, I don't, uh, I can't see everybody's screen because there's a. Mr. Chair, I've got one, then this is James. Yes, Councilmember Rogers. So I guess this is questions for Cindy. Um, can you talk about how tools change over time and you know how you've adapted and the councils have adapted as the tools have changed? Sure. Um, two things come to mind. Um, I would say right now the potential um, for uh, council members to work in a collaborative way with the mayor is um, much more significant in your toolbox than uh, say five, six, four, three, two years ago. Um, just based on the uh, rapport that you have and the the way things have started out with the new administration. So, so that would be cool that you would, um, of course, want to take advantage of um, or, you know, be especially aware of. Uh, the council has evolved to be much more proactive. Uh, and it started many, many years ago with Dale Lambert when he was on the council and he was pointing out why, why as a legislature would we be just reacting? And so um, the council has progressively become more proactive at the requests and interests of council members. So you'll see that council members now initiate things much more often than that type of thing. You're smiling, James. <laughs> um, so, so you can initiate things um, and we now have more tools in place or more knowledge about how to do that as opposed to waiting uh, for a transmittal to come from whichever mayor is in office and then the council acting on it and uh, like they don't have other choices besides saying yes or no to that proposal. There are always other choices. And it's interesting because it's like a pendulum too. You've just seen it shift, you know, as tools can move and change as, you know, council members come and go. And it's, it's, it's a great opportunity for you to see all these different tools. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, Kate, council members, any other um, questions on this uh, item? Tools in general. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so we will just go right into our um, formal meeting. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, welcome to the Salt Lake City Council limited formal meeting. If you're just tuning in, our, our meeting remotely due to the declarations of emergency. We first met earlier at 2 o'clock p.m. Um, as the Redevelopment Agency Board, followed by us changing our hats and meeting as the city for a work session to discuss some briefing items. We're now convening for a limited formal meeting, which means that this is not a standard formal meeting agenda. Tonight, the council needs to consider action on only one agenda item, a resolution that would extend May the mayor's March 18th proclamation de declaring a local emergency relating to a magnitude 5.7 earthquake. Therefore, since this is the only item for the council to take action on tonight, there, and there is no other council business, there will be no public comment opportunity. The next opportunity for public comment will be at the Council's Tuesday, April 24th formal meeting at 9 p.m. Also, the Council always welcomes your comments by mailing us at P.O. Box 145-476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84114-5476. Or you can email us at council.comments at slcgov.com or by calling our 24-hour comment line 801 535-7654. All agenda-related comments received through any source are shared with the Council and added to the Council's public meeting record within 24 hours following the Council meeting. For instructions to guide you on how to practice, uh, excuse me, participate electronically in any of our WebEx meetings, please visit slccouncil.com or call 801-535-7600. Thank you. And we'll just move right uh, into it. Um, we'll skip items um, A through D and uh, move to section E, which is our new business. Um, that is a resolution that would extend the mayor's March 18th proclamation declaring a local emergency relating to a magnitude 5.7 earthquake. And I will look for a motion. Mr. Chair, yes. I must have I move that the council adopt a resolution extending a proclamation declaring a local emergency relating to the 5.7 earthquake. Second. All right. Um, and did you? Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. So I have a motion uh, from Councilmember Fowler and a second from Councilmember Rogers. Um, is there any discussion to this item? Don't need it. I'm sorry. I I just need to jump in really fast. This is Katie. You yes. do need to select a date to extend the emergency okay thank you katie i was i that was my hesitation but i saw that there was a um a, an alternative one but um oh sorry yeah and i misread it so um councilmember fowler do you want to specify a time how long are we doing this for <laughs> um the if we wanted to mirror the county council we could extend it to july 6th i believe that's correct. I Okay, to July 6th. Okay, and then Council Member Rogers, did you want to second that? Yeah. Um, is there any discussion to that motion? Um, yes, Council Member Valdemoros. Your mic is off. Sorry. Is this extension so that folks that have time until April 22nd to provide information about the earthquake um, problems that they had with their homes. And then they, they give that to the county and the county gives to the state, the state gives it to FEMA. So this is why we're extending this all the way till July 6th. Yes, and, okay. and that's my understanding. And uh, my understanding is also that, um, yeah, by extending it, it gives us, um, it, puts us in a better position to request FEMA funds mm -hmm. and that we have to extend it for a pretty lengthy period of time because of the 
multiple levels of government, but also because of the delay that we're all experiencing because of the other emergency okay. we're experiencing. So, right. um, but also my understanding is that this isn't going to interfere with any um, any normal operations. That there's there's no legal downside in us continuing it for that length of time. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, questions or debate on this item? All right, seeing none, I'll go ahead and call for a vote. Council Member Rogers. Yes. Council Member uh, Valdemoros. Yes. Council Member uh, Mono. Yes. Council Member Dugan. Yes. Council Member Fowler. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So that is a unanimous with one absent T, which is um, Council Member Johnston. Um, this concludes our limited formal council meeting, and this meeting will stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.